Hello, I'm Norman Swan. Welcome to this programme, An Ounce of Prevention. It's about the MBS item number 717, the 45 to 49 year old health check. We're all getting older. Well, you are, I'm not. And with that comes an increased risk of developing a chronic disease. In fact, according to the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, in the age group that we are talking about, the vast majority of men and women have at least one risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Prevention and early intervention are what the MBS item 717 is all about. It allows GPs to provide a preventive health check for people between those ages, inclusive, who are at risk of developing a chronic disease. In this programme, we'll be talking about what you need to know about the item number and answer some of the frequently asked questions, such as who's eligible, eligible, what does it include, what must the health check include, which doctors can claim the item, what's the role of the GP, and how can you work with your practice nurse and other health professionals, plus, of course, the financial side. We're coming to you across Australia through the Rural Health Education Foundation satellite network. As always, there are a number of useful resources available on the Rural Health Education Foundation's website, rhef.com.au. Now let's meet our panel. Bronwyn Harvey is the Medical Advisor in the Population Health Division of the Australian Government's Department of Health and Ageing. Welcome Bronwyn. Thank you Norman. Mark Nelson is a General Practitioner and Senior Professorial Fellow at the Menzies Research Institute at the University of Tasmania. Welcome Mark. Thank you Norman. And our second Mark is Mark Harris, an Academic GP and Director of the Centre for Primary Healthcare and Equity at the University of New South Wales. Welcome Mark. Hello Norman. So what is this health check? Well, Norman, it's an opportunity for GPs to undertake a preventive health assessment in their patients in the age group of 45 to 49 who are at risk of chronic disease because they have one or more risk factors. It's part of the Australian Better Health Initiative, which is um, a Council of Australian Governments or COAG initiative. And this aims to improve the management of chronic disease in the Australian community. So who's eligible? Um, anyone who's aged 45 to 49 who has a identified risk factor and uh, they, they are at risk of developing chronic disease but the risk factor has already been identified. The lifestyle risk factors can be considered such as smoking, physical activity, poor nutrition and alcohol misuse and the biomedical risk factors can also be taken into account high cholesterol, high blood pressure, impaired glucose metabolism excess weight or a family history of chronic disease. And what are the components of the health check? The components of the health check include information collection, taking a patient history and uh, undertaking relevant examinations and um, investigations as clinically required, making an overall assessment of the patient's health, including the patient's readiness to make lifestyle changes, and providing advice and information to the patient um, or appropriate treatment if, um, if that's necessary. And the rebate is? The rebate is $102.20. And do you have to do it all yourself? No, you don't have to do it all yourself. You can delegate some of the tasks to your nurse. And things that can be done by the nurse include uh, identifying the patients who would be eligible, um, collecting information such as um, taking the history, uh, doing the biomedical measurements such as BMI and waist circumference. Um, and also can, uh, the nurse can provide information to the, to the patient about the services that are available or, the, um, or, or in fact uh, preventive health counselling. And does it have to be done in one hit? No, you can do it over several um, consultations if you wish. Quite frequently people want to get the result of a test back before they uh, finalise the, the health check and um, take that into account in the advice they give the patient. Now there are other patient uh, you know, enhanced item numbers in the schedule which require you know, two or three visits, you know, the asthma plan and that sort of thing. Is there a compulsory follow up here for intervention? There's not a compulsory follow up. What, what we expect is that doctors will, will um, work <coughs> out how they wish to manage this patient. Now some patients will be managed through normal attendance items and referrals to other practitioners. Other patients can be managed if they have a chronic disease through the chronic disease management items which um, um, are available to all GPs. And how's it been taken up? It's been taken up very well. There's an average of about 10,000 uh, consultations a month since it's been introduced and over the year there's been about 120,000 consultations um, who've used the health check and I think Mark's got more data well, on that later. We'll talk about that mm. later. We've got um, a case study, if you like, but certainly a GP, uh, Jenny May, who's been using uh, item number 717 and uh, has a lot of experience with it and using her practice nurse. So we thought we'd talk to her about her experience and we'll follow that through the programme. So here's Jenny May. 
I'm Jenny May and um, I work in this practice, Peel Healthcare. I work part-time as do another five doctors here who make up about three full-time equivalent GPs. We've got two excellent practice nurses and uh, also some sessions provided by some other allied health professionals. Tamworth's a very under-doctored population at the moment so for most practitioners they're working on a full-time equivalent load of probably close on 2,000 patients each. For full-time GPs the workload is exhausting. Well 717's a, 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 I guess a new way of thinking or, and um, I guess being a preventive item number is, is a new, um, something new for GPs to think about. Certainly for me it's provided an opportunity to uh, really look at prevention in, in those patients and um, something that I probably was doing anyway, it's, it's, it's made it more explicit. So often I might see a patient with a minor problem, such as hay fever. In Tamworth that's quite a common thing. In spring we get a lot of flowering trees, in fact our plane trees are one of our biggest culprits. So if they're in the right age group and if they have a risk factor, I would offer them the preventive health check. Now, by the way, you're 45. That's right. And I look after your dad, don't I? And he's got diabetes. Yeah. He yeah. Is. Okay. There's a new um, new thing out called a 45 to 49 year old preventive health check. Mm -hmm. um, what that involves is, I guess, spending some time sitting down, looking at um, some of the risk factors um, that are involved in later chronic disease and seeing if there are ways that we can look at your lifestyle and, and look at what's going on for you at the moment and make sure that you're in a good position to negotiate the next 20 years um, healthy. If I come across a woman who has risk factors, I would explain to them what the item number's about and offer them perhaps to get the, the cholesterol, blood sugar, those sorts of things checked um, and then come and see me for a quarantine consultation about the health check at a later time, perhaps a week or so down the line. So would that appeal to you? Yeah, does it take long? No, what would involve at the moment is I'd get your form to do some, some blood tests and then get you back to the practice nurse to check your blood pressure, check your weight um, and make sure we've got a good history of things, things like what you're eating and, and your physical exercise. Mm -hmm. And then you and I'd sit down and spend some time going through that. All right. Yep. That sounds okay? Yeah, that sounds okay. So what's I think 45 to 49 is a pivotal age. It's a pivotal time. Often it's a time when you've got ageing parents, so you're starting to look yourself at um, sort of causes of morbidity and mortality, and, and it's probably a time at which you're ready to reflect on some of those lifestyle factors. So what sort of things does it cover? Well, prevention's a, a big issue, but the sorts of things that we would look at are things like your alcohol consumption, whether or not you smoke. I've no doubt that if we can get our middle-aged people to take up some very simple lifestyle interventions, increasing physical activity, reducing weight, um, reducing alcohol and smoking, that that will have a very significant impact on morbidity and mortality as people age. There's no doubt that um, it's an important intervention tool and anything we can do to prevent the onset of serious illness is money and time well spent. All right, so that's the form okay. and I'll get the girls to make a long appointment for you. All right. Thanks. Jenny May. Mark Nelson, is, the, uh, is cardiovascular risk factors the main game? Or are cardiovascular risk factors the main game? Well, I think they're a very good example of what we should uh, follow in this program. Um, because it's the most prevalent and is the, still the number one cause of uh, morbidity and mortality in the Australian community. And of course crossover to other conditions such as exactly. stroke and, um, and, and so on. And also shared risk factors with uh, emerging diseases like type 2 diabetes. What is the prevalence of these risk factors? Well if you look at the CVD risk factors as example, uh, the uh, common one we've just spoken about, um, overweight and obesity, if you look here you can see that uh, it's really a majority in the, in the population that actually do have these conditions. Uh, this is data from Ausdiab, which is a community-based uh, survey. I've got more recent data from 2005 on a study called IDEA, which is general practice-based um, levels of overweight and obesity, and the figures are even higher than this. Um, that um, shows that uh, obesity is getting more common, but of course that the obesity is a driver of the very chronic conditions that mean that these people are appearing at our clinics. 
What about blood pressure? Well, blood pressure is an old hoary one. It's um, something that's very well managed by general practitioners. Um, if we look at the prevalence is figures it? here... I thought the rule of halves still applied. Uh, the, well, anywhere between the rule of halves and thirds, but when I'm saying very well managed, is comparable to uh, expert centres in hypertension, it is, is that general practitioners do just as well. So um, I, I think they need to be patted on the back when it comes to that. Um, what I would like them to do is expand beyond hypertension and, and to look at all uh, risk factors and integrate them so together. So what's the prevalence? Well, it's, it's still quite a prevalent condition, even though on a population basis it is falling, as we can see here for the figures. 16% um, uh, treated, so there's a significant numbers of untreated ones with a program like this may well pick up. Um, you can see that about a fifth of these people, I must apologise, the age bands here are not quite matching the 45 to uh, 49 year old, but this is the, the data that we have. Of course, the interesting thing here is, and I think it was a recent paper from the Women's Health Study, showing that women around this age who have high normal blood pressure, so in other words, the, within the normal range traditionally that GP, so you're not even in the mild hypertension range, have almost the same risk as women with baseline hypertension at the beginning of the study. And so how we define what is a risk factor is actually quite marginal. Well, I, I think the whole thing about blood pressure in the example, it's, it's a continuous uh, risk factor. The higher your blood pressure, the more likely you are to have heart attack or stroke. And therefore, the description of hypertension is actually an artificial one. We really need to consider it as a continuum rather than an absolute. Is above a certain level, you've got a risk factor. Below, you don't. And the way to do that is through the absolute risk calculator again, where you look at individual risk factors, pour them together. What is their level of blood pressure? What is the level of cholesterol? Because you're much more likely to see somebody with multiple risk factors that aren't very high. Exactly, and they're the people who are very likely to be undertreated because on individual risk factors, they're not identified as being at high risk of having a heart attack. And what you've got to remember is that the majority of heart attacks are in the people who um, don't have high individual risk factors. And let's just look at the data for cholesterol. Uh, for cholesterol, once again, the uh, central band here, 45 to 54, and once again, you can see that, that uh, when it comes to high cholesterol or dyslipidemia, is that uh, it's the majority who have it. So if you go looking for it, you will find it. And at this age, I mean, the, the other interesting thing about this age, well, there's two things. One is, common myth is that women have lower rates of heart disease and men they have exactly the same heart disease rates and men, it's just time shifted. It's time shifted by 10 years, and, but another important change in, the, in the, the gender wars, if you want to consider it that way, is diabetes, is, is that where Paul Keating's uh, J-curve is about to hit us. Um, type 2 diabetes is shifting um, down in age, and what we do know with relative to women is that it's a greater driver of CVD risk in women than it is in men, so it basically eliminates your advantage of being a female. Well, let's go back to the absolute risk tools because if you're doing this assessment on someone, uh, you could use the Framingham, presumably, or the New Zealand tool. Well, the New Zealand tool is based on the Framingham algorithm. The problem with that is twofold. I would just, one is that it gives you your 10 year risk. It's not good at the age of 45. At 45, your risk is probably going to be more likely 20 years out, and the tools don't tell you that. So, how valuable is the tool really at, um, at the age of 45? Because it's just not really going to tell you that much. Well, I'd have to disagree with you. I think it tells you a lot. Um, is, is that you're, you, you're correct. Your, your number one driver of risk is your age. The older you are, the more likely you are to die, uh, even though you're not ageing, Norman. I'm not ageing. Um, getting younger, in fact. And under those circumstances, what, I think what you're talking about, people who have high relative risk, that is relative to somebody of their own age and gender, their blood pressure is up or their cholesterol is up, but their absolute risk, which is their possibility of having a heart attack or stroke in the next five to ten years, is still modest. Now, when it comes to medical interventions, whether we're cost effective or not, then the high absolute risk people are the people who we get the benefit from by treating with drugs and other ancillary medical treatments. Um, but when it comes to people at high absolute ri uh, relative, relative risk, risk. but uh, modest um, absolute risk, then it doesn't mean we don't do anything. It means we intervene because they will have risk, factor, risk factors by definition. And what we can educate those patients about, if you do nothing, as your age goes up and you track through time, you will end up on medication or you will end up with these diseases. And are Australian GPs using the absolute risk tools? Well, I'm very pleased to say that uh, the latest evidence we have is that Australia and New Zealand are leading the world in the, in the adoption of absolute risk calculators and using these for decision making. Um, the 
our concern was is that people would use them just to educate the the uh, public about well you're at risk, you're in the red section, you you need to do something. Um, what we also need to remember is as doctors when they're in the red section, we need to do something. Now. The evidence for annual checkups, I mean this is not an annual checkup, but annual checkups is pretty thin and until this study started I think the evidence for this sort of checkup is pretty thin. We'll come to that in a moment with Mark Harris. But let's assume for example for a moment you pick up stuff that's useful. Do we know on an evidence base what the right long-term management strategies are for picking up somebody at fairly low absolute risk of, of in the future and what the right things are to do? Well, you're right about the evidence around um, programs being fairly weak, although Mark will have specific data related to uh, 717. Um, but there, there, isn't a, it, there still is an advantage in looking for it. But do we know what to do? In other words, well, um, we've just got to rely on the randomised trials? Well, what, what we do know is, is that we can rely on the randomised control because the individual risk factors, the management, we know that there's very good evidence about outcomes related to it. You know, we have effective drug and other therapies for hypertension and dyslipidemia that do reduce people's risk of acute events and dying. Given that, so we're talking about cardiovascular disease and it spans, it's a pretty useful thing because it spans lots of risk factors. What should um, a GP do about depression, for example? Now, some people say that depression almost gets up there with cholesterol as a risk factor for coronary heart disease. Should they be doing an, uh, you know, a quick depression inventory? I, I, it certainly is worthwhile. It's, it's both a risk factor for coronary artery disease and also an outcome of coronary artery disease. So you can have, if you like, reactionary depression to it. So it certainly is worth looking for it. And is there a risk that um, the overzealous GP will start doing PSA tests on their male patients just because they're in for their checkup, and then we're going to get a rash well, of unnecessary Well, the, the thing is, is that what I'd strongly recommend is about evidence-based actions. Um, it, this is not a screening program, it's, it's, it's basically an assessment, but um, I, would, I would countenance personally against doing PSAs. Which is why we're talking about um, yes. um, cardiovascular disease, because in fact that's where the strongest evidence base is. When well, you start getting into cancer, yes. you're really getting into target country. But, but you can see from the data that I showed you that, that you can really do look at it as a population basis, and if you did screen, you're going to find it very difficult to find a clean skin, somebody who doesn't have a risk factor. For example, half the population here are at risk by definition because they've got male gender. So tell me about the SNAP framework. Well, um, I, I, once again I defer to uh, Mark, but I mean the important thing about smoking, nutrition, alcohol and physical activity is, is that they underlie most of the chronic conditions that where we've got effective treatments for and effective preventive programs for. So um, you need to assess them and something like a lifestyle um, uh, assessment. Um, we we can use the, the program that will, instead of prescribing drugs, we can prescribe smoking cessation activities, um, nutritional advice, physical activity, etc. And alcohol. Uh, and alcohol, uh, moderation in alcohol. So if we focus on outcomes, what might we expect here? Well, um, it, it depends on, mostly in programs like this, we'll, once again we'll let Mark speak, but usually you have to deal with, with surrogate endpoints. It's very hard to actually show initially that you're going to have hard endpoints like reduction in cancer or acute myocardial infarction. But the surrogate measures are pretty good measures of what you're likely to see in the future and as, as long as it's evidence based I think there's a huge opportunity for us GPs to do something for on a population basis. Identify the risk. In a moment we'll come to Mark Harris talking about the uh, study he's done looking at the uh, outcomes and effectiveness of the 717 item number. But let's go back to Jenny May's surgery and look more at how she's using her practice nurse in the implementation of this item number. I'm a registered nurse and I actually just stumbled into this position as a practice nurse um, when this practice opened about two years ago. So for the 45-year-old health check, you know, where a nurse can do something just as well as a GP, we're just saving them that extra time. What we're going to do is a few observations, blood pressure, weight, height, circumference around the waist. Um, then we'll ask you a few questions about, you know, family history, diet, exercise, etc. I think the key thing is obviously to get information about pe where people are 
in terms of their risk factors um, and obviously you'll get some of that information in patient history and some from laboratory investigations. Just, just pop over here. The great benefit of general practice is that often we know our patients and we know their family contacts, their family histories and their capacities perhaps to look at different lifestyle interventions. There are a myriad of tools we can use for both assessing and um, encouraging lifestyle change such as life scripts. So you filled this out in the waiting room, did you? Yeah. Now Amanda, no exercise there? No. Oh, okay. So tell me about that. It's just hard to fit it in. So Some patients there. respond better to different ways of providing information. Some people prefer to, to you know, write it down or, or fill in a checklist. Other people are more verbal and would prefer to share that information in a as they see it a more face-to-face -face way. Did you used to exercise at uh, all? Yeah, yeah fair bit. You used to yeah. go for walks and things Walking. like that. So you like to walk or? Yeah, I do. Yeah. What do you think we can do to get you back out there exercising uh, uh, again? Look, I've just got to do it. I've just got yeah. to find a space in the day and do it. Whether it be, you know, walking in your lunch break or yeah. um, treadmill. I don't know whether some people like them, some don't, so we actually up to you. <laughs> we actually bought up, um, a treadmill into the office. I've actually got no excuse now. Okay, so. oh, well, there you go. Okay, so we need to look at increasing that to at least probably five times a week and at least 30 to 40 minutes ideally. Do you think that's possible? Oh, it's possible, but yeah, yeah. I've got to just make a time to fit it in. Yeah. So. Certainly our nurses do use the Life Scripts program in terms of being able to assess and also inform patients of some of lifestyle risk factors and ways to deal with them. Um, they're also well versed in um, assessing patients in terms of their context and again as they see the patients often um, or more, sometimes more often with chronic disease than we do, um, their working knowledge of those patients is a real benefit. Um, we might pick up something extra that the GP may not have time to necessarily pick up or vice versa and it just works really well. Did Jenny ask you to keep a food diary? Yes. Is that, did you pop that over there? Yeah I did. Cool. Okay. How do you think your diet is? Most days it's okay. Not too bad? Yep. Okay so that doesn't look too bad. Um, no smoking which is good. <laughs> um, do you drink much alcohol? Probably five nights out of seven, I'll have a glass of wine. Yeah, that's fine, so that's no problem. Someone who's got, you know, four children and, and ageing parents, um, expecting them to, to have a diet that's very different from the rest of the family, for instance, is, is not realistic. So it's a matter of tailoring your advice and tailoring to their problem and to their particular context. I'll pop it in here and then um, Jenny will be able to have it when you go into the other room. Just saves her a bit of time as well. In this particular practice, we use the computer extensively. It's a fully electronic medical record. Um, X-ray and pathology are downloaded automatically into our system for patient information as well as for practices looking at computerised medical records and internet access is a real boon. There are algorithms and there are templates that are downloadable from most websites about how to manage things like the 45 to 49 and health check and um, other chronic disease item numbers with well evidenced and easy to use templates. We've got a really good team of people and it's enjoyable I guess to come to work so I mean we still have our moments I guess but <laughs> that's like every job so yeah I love it. The uh, team were working with Janie May, an impressive uh, general practice set up. But I hope, did you actually spot the deliberate mistake? How to measure waste, waste circumference, Mark? Uh, yes, well, preferentially it should be done um, with the clothing removed and also measured from behind, midway between where the ribs end and the upper part of the pelvis to get an accurate measurement. Our actor might have been just a little bit um, shy of doing that. I think so. Mark Harris, tell us about this study you've done. Well, it's, we've done a couple of things. We've looked at the Medicare data to begin with, and uh, that's shown us some interesting things. It's shown that the uptake has been quite high, as Bronwyn already mentioned, amongst GPs. And in terms of population coverage, uh, we're looking at 
equal numbers of males and females, which, which is, is great. Which is great and a lot better than we might expect if people were just uh, mirroring how they normally present to general practice. Um, still uh, coverage in rural remote areas, a bit less than in urban areas. Um, we then went on and have done a study specifically looking at what effect the health check has on GP management and patient behavioural risk factors, so the SNAP risk factors, uh, over a three month period following the health check. So is this a before and after study? Yeah, yeah. so it's not a randomised control trial, we're doing one of those now, but um, it's the best that we could do in, in a real world situation looking at what might, uh, what effect the... And did you have a control group or each person was their own control? Each person was their control group. So we, we looked at them before and after the health check. So we enrolled them in the study. We then uh, recalled them to the practice. We, we uh, uh, got them to come to the practice and um, then the GP did the health check and then we followed them up uh, away from the practice. What did you find? Um, we found that the health check, first of all, had a pretty dramatic effect on the amount of preventive care that people got, the uh, degree to which people reported that their GP had assessed their SNAP risk factors and offered them advice and interventions. Um, the level at which they'd actually then went on to refer them to other providers was not quite as good as we hoped. There was an improvement, uh, but still there was a significant proportion of at-risk people, um, so over it was half, kind of, it was that kind of, weren't getting referred. So what they were getting was advice which hung in the air rather than a practical oh, They were getting reform. more than advice. They were getting uh, written materials and, and um, for example, where there was a nurse in the practice, they were getting some education within the practice, but they weren't getting the kind of intensive uh, interventions that we might think are optimal for the most high-risk patients. So not just the people what sort of things are you risk. talking about? People who've got multiple risk factors, people who've got the, the not only the, the, the behavioural risk factors, but some of the physiological risk factors. A referral to what? To a dietitian or a diet and a education program or to a physical activity program or an exercise physiologist particularly. Um, those, in those two areas, uh, we saw an increase in referral, but not as much as we would have liked. That sounds like somebody from Sydney talking. Hmm. Well, yes, although fortunately um, divisions around Australia have been working as part of their allied health program, more allied health programs and other programs to try and make some of these things more available in rural areas. Uh, and that, so that's starting to happen in rural areas. But that's one of the reasons we think that the uptake of the item has been not quite as high in the rural areas. So in terms of, so people's awareness was raised, they had a bit more knowledge. That but it, but there, there wasn't rubber on the road, there wasn't change. There was change in their behaviour, but the change, because uh, we measured that as well, there was change first of all in uh, their readiness to change, so their... their uh, on a motivational scale. Motivational scale, so they moved from being you know, pre-contemplative to contemplative or contemplative to action, um, particularly in relation to physical activity and also in relation to diet. And the strongest evidence was around physical activity. And we saw that people reported an increase in the number of minutes of physical activity that they did, moderate uh, intensity physical activity. Um, uh, so that was quite uh, significant. Uh, we also saw, particularly in men, an improvement in the use of low fat meals and uh, eating um, more, more portions of fruit and vegetables per day. Um, on self-report? On self-report, yes. But uh, we asked them at the beginning and then we asked them how many proportions. We didn't just ask them whether they changed. Right. Um, less dramatic changes in terms of smoking and alcohol in our study, which is a little disappointing. Uh, but enough there to say that in this very short-term initial study uh, that there had been an improvement and that's uh, you didn't take blood, so you don't know what the cholesterol. We didn't take bloods. So that's part of the current study that we're. So there's, if you like, um, a bit of a failure to launch. In other words, there's action, there's movement. It's there, the, the the signs and the, the heavens are sort of going in the right direction, but there's now something. Presumably, there's something missing in terms of what GPs need to do to really lock in the benefits of this uh, item number. Well, especially for people who are high risk, we think that. For people who have multiple risk factors particularly, uh, that it's worthwhile uh, really uh, doing something additional to the sort of advice that we're able to give in a, in a consultation. And this goes back to the conversation I was having with Mark Nelson, which is that 
we're tuned into high cholesterols, high blood pressure, rather than multiple risk factors at a, at a lower yeah. level, which don't look dramatic, but really add up to quite a poisonous yeah. combination. So that absolute risk assessment should be one of the things we should be using, not only to decide whether people go on antihypertensive or a drug or a statin, but also who's the priority for referral to a dietitian, uh, an exercise physiologist, etc. And when you did the evaluation, because one of the things here is our GPs picking it right that they're going for people who are at high risk to begin with, mm -hmm. how well did they pick it in terms of their patients? In terms of the referrals, um, in, in this study, as a result of the health check, we found that they were doing pretty well for the patients they referred. The no, problem no. was that there was a group that they didn't refer. So, I mean, of the 170, 200 patients you looked yeah. at, yeah. did they all qualify at the beginning as high risk, even though the GP had done the assessment? Okay. Um, no, they didn't uh, qualify as uh, being high risk. Sorry, uh, I mean having a risk but factor. We, we found that they all had a risk factor. GPs were actually very anxious about this because one of the criteria for the item is you've got to have um, you've got to have so a risk were factor, and so worried about the Medicare counselor coming. Yeah, in. so we said, look, if you if if it happens, we'll we'll cover it. Don't worry. In all of the patients we looked at, we didn't find one that didn't have a risk factor. So, it, because. Uh, in the population, these risk factors are very common, and of course, general practice itself tends to be a higher risk population. So uh, we don't expect that there's going to be many patients in this age group who aren't eligible. So action, not letting it go, is really important as part of your GP practice system. Yeah, and, and with the people who are high risk intervening uh, intensively. What's the government thinking in terms of the next step after the 717 to kind of lock in the benefits? Um, well, I think that uh, part of it's to promote uh, the, the work that um, Mark's doing, the, the evidence base for using um, the item and for succeeding with the item and, and, and identifying those things which GPs can do better that will lock the, 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 um, the gains to be made out of the health assessment. Well, let's go back to Jenny May's surgery in Tamworth with our mystery patient and see what happens next. All right, so you've just been to see Alicia. Yep, she's done and blood she's pressure and things. gone through all that and she's put it all up here in your records. Um, when I looked at the physical activity assessment that she did with you, is that, that this is it? That's it. Um, it seems that um, you're really not getting much of a chance to be very physically active. No, I'm not. Say someone was overweight um, and likely inactive, um, the sorts of ways that I would approach it is that Often these people are very busy, they're trying to juggle teenage children, ageing parents. Um, so I might frame it such as, uh, I know you're very busy, have you found any time for yourself or how are you working out ways to look after your own health? Provide a very open question for them to say, yes, there is a problem fitting in time to actually do things the way they want to be doing them. The other thing that um, I noticed on looking at this, that your father actually developed bowel cancer when he was about 53 that about was. 53 so the the recommendation is that um, for first degree relatives of someone with with a, a bowel cancer occurring before the age of 55 that we might well um, consider colonoscopy for you often if the patient has a family history they'll be well aware of some of the potential pitfalls and problems with those sorts of illnesses and um, often keener to make a difference so what I'll do is I'll organise a referral for you. Okay. Not urgently, but something that we should be looking towards as a check. As a check. Okay, sounds good. Aside from the referrals for diagnostic um, things like colonoscopies, um, I might also involve people like dietitians um, or diabetic educators or, or people with those sorts of skills or mental health professionals if those problems were identified as part of the health check. Um, what about calcium? Um, Do you know what foods calcium is in? Yeah, all the dairy stuff. Yep. And I've made the effort to have um, the yogurt in yes. the mornings. Um, that's probably my really only dairy right. intake. Okay, so that's something else we need to bear in mind. Obviously the risk of osteoporosis goes up mm. after menopause and as we get older. But what we know is if we can optimise your calcium intake, that the... With a motivated patient, obviously, um, success of, of any sort of preventive strategy is high. I guess the most important thing is providing patients with information. My experience is that probably 20 to 25% of people will 
um, really take up or, or be very keen or be in the right space to think about an intervention, uh, a lifestyle intervention. And the others, often it's a matter of providing information and, and maybe it's something they take up at a later stage. Ingrained patterns, both of eating and of lack of exercise, are hard to move. So you're going to need some support to get that all happening. As I said, the easiest thing I can do is provide you with the referral for the dietitian. But what I'm going to suggest is that we reconvene in about eight to ten weeks' time yep. and see where you're at. Okay. okay. You can only claim the item number once, but the prevention is an intrinsic part, an implicit part of general practice. So these are lifestyle factors that you're likely talking to your patients anyway. The, the health check gives you an opportunity to spend quarantine time dealing with these issues, but they will continue to be a major part of your caring for the patient over the next however long. Jenny May. So what are our takeaway messages about the 45 to 49 year old checkup? Mark Harris? Well, I think it's worthwhile. Uh, it's certainly worth the GP's time and effort doing it. Um, and if we can identify people who are high risk, then we should be intervening perhaps more actively than, than we have been in the past. Well, Nelson? I'd have to agree with Mark there. I think the important thing is that you need to assess all the risks, not just the isolated risk factors, that you need to do calculate an absolute risk score, put all those in together, and that we need to act on the results. We often complain about how difficult it is to change our patient's behaviour. Just think about how difficult it is to change your own behaviour and do something about it. Bronwyn? Yes, I'd like um, GPs to feel confident in using the item, to understand how to use it, to, to see this program and uh, see how, some ideas about how they might incorporate it in their practice and in doing so improve the health of their patients. Thank you very much to you all. I hope you got a lot out of tonight's program. If you're interested in obtaining more information about the MBS item number 717 or the Life Scripts resources, you'll find it on the Department of Health and Aging's website, health.gov.au forward slash EPC. And there are a number of resources available on the Rural Health Education Foundation's website, and that's at rhef.com.au. Now, don't forget to complete and send in your evaluation forms. They're really very important to us to be able to continually improve the sorts of programs we provide for you. And please register for CBD points by completing the attendance sheet. Our thanks to the Australian Government's Department of Health and Ageing for making this program possible, and thanks to you for taking the time to attend and contribute. I'm Norman Swan. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.